Um, I'm really excited to be here and um, spend some time with you. Hi, Destiny. I'm just going to give you a little video. <laughs> um, okay, so I just wanted to give us a little disclaimer. So we're going to watch, we're going to start off with watching a video, but I just wanted to give a little background before we do. So I'm a researcher by trade and I specifically study uh, self-doubt. And um, a lot of my focus is with mothers, but I also study self-doubt in fathers, in men, and also in children and adolescents in order to compare those findings to how women and mothers struggle with self-doubt. So while some of the presentation, the conversation is gonna be focused on mothers, if you have self-doubt, then you can relate to a lot of this and a lot of men um, and adolescents have self-doubt. So I don't want it to feel too laser focused just on moms. And also I think that it'll help you if you're not a mother, it'll help you understand the mothers in your life. And so it might help you understand your own mother, your sister, um, you know, a cousin, you know, someone, in your own life. And um, so I hope that gives a little context to um, the, the background. So we're going to start with a quick video. And as you all know, with Zoom, sometimes it can be a little choppy, you know, at times. But um, if the visuals get off, you can just close your eyes and, um, and listen to it and you'll still get the message. But let's go ahead and play the video. Just read them. Just read them. Okay. So the first one is you are not doing enough. Your mental health is not important. Just take care of everyone else. You are a broken person that barely anyone can stand. You'll never be anyone but just a mom. You're too weak and emotional. You don't give your children enough time and love. Your weight embarrasses your kids and you should have better style. No one will want you if you ever have to date again with a body like that. You were too hard on Flynn last night. You're going to scar her. She's just a kid. Hi. Hello. I'm Rebecca. I'm nice, Nikki. To meet nice to meet you. you. I'm Hannah. I'm Kira. Nice to nice meet you. Nice to meet you. You could read out loud one of your cards. Mine says, you should have done more. You can't be great at work or at home. You'll never be 100% at either. You'll always be mediocre. My body is so ugly now that I've had a baby. Oh, wow. Aww. This is going to make me cry. Is that what you're trying to do? <laughs> Everybody will be better off without you. Sometimes I think that too, honestly. Sometimes I think I could just get in my car and leave and it would just be so much better. Yes. With, they could just make it work without me. How did that feel reading your negative thoughts to another person? I feel like it's one thing to write them down for yourself and to accept them yourself, but to have somebody else hear them is totally different. Vulnerable and like I want to say these things out loud to yeah. someone. Yeah so that you can be like, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and then be like, no, that's totally legit. You know, when you hear someone else talking about all the things that they do, yeah. um, you know, we shouldn't be so hard on ourselves. You're perfect. Perfect, just like you are. <laughs> Those cards in your hand. Oh, can I just rip them up now? <laughs> Should we rip them up? Can I can I get rid of them forever? <laughs> Mine are really thick. <laughs> Let the universe have them. Awesome. Yeah. Woohoo! Okay. 
Okay, so that video can be quite emotional, uh, and uh, and that's okay. So many of us don't really realize the terrible things that we say to ourselves, and we see what other people say to themselves. Um, it can be quite shocking. So I invite anybody just throw any reaction in the chat. Like, what did you think of the video? Anything come to mind? Anything pop in your mind? Um, what is anything that jumped out? Um, is it surprising to you? Is it um, something that you're already deeply familiar with? But um, I'll ask you throughout the, the conversation tonight to just throw some things in the chat if you're comfortable. So interesting story about that video. Um, we uh, I'm from Richmond, Virginia, and we shot it here in Richmond, and we recruited the, the mothers to come and do it, and they didn't know each other, and they didn't know the premise of the video. We just said, you know, do you want to participate in this video about being a mother? And so um, the director of the video was a woman, but um, almost everyone else on the set, um, they were men. And um, so one of the men came over to me when we were prepping the women and telling them we wanted them to think of the last terrible thing they said to themselves. And one of the men said, Catherine, how do you know this is going to work? I mean, what if these women come in and say they think they're beautiful and they think they're amazing? And I was like, oh, <laughs> That is not going to happen. That is not going to be the reaction. And then lo and behold, these strangers all showed up and, and all had pretty terrible things to say about themselves, as you just saw. So I want you all to take a minute and um, think about, and if you happen to have a piece of paper handy, or you, certainly you're probably on your computer or your phone, but um, to take a second and jot down the last terrible thing that you said to yourself. And it is already seven o'clock at night. And so if you are like most people who struggle with self-doubt, then you probably don't have to go back to yesterday to think of an example of something terrible and cutthroat and ugly that you said to yourself. So take a minute and jot that down. And the reason that I ask you, it's one thing to kind of conjure it up in your mind, but if you're able to write it down, it can be a really eye-opening experience because there's something about seeing in your own handwriting how you really feel about yourself that can really kind of shock you into action and healing some of this hurt inside. So I'm a huge fan of therapy. I have been through decades um, of therapy. And um, this was an exercise that my own therapist had me do probably about eight years ago. And, um, and she said, Catherine, I want you to write down the last terrible thing that you said to yourself. And I still have it in my journal to this day. And what I wrote down that day was, and I quote, you are a poor excuse for a strong woman. So that was the last terrible thing that I said to myself. And if you today are like I was eight years ago, this soundtrack of negativity could be pretty constant in your mind. And you may not even know that it's there. You may not even know that it's happening. And that's part of the beauty of this exercise is to begin to acknowledge it, to write it down. And then the real strength comes when you can say it out loud. So. I'm not embarrassed to tell you that eight years ago, I thought I was a poor excuse for a strong woman. Um, I'm very proud of it because I was in that place and I have come through it on the other side and I don't think those things about myself anymore. So in my book, Slay Like a Mother, the premise of the book is all based on um, what I call a dragon of self-doubt. And that is this negative voice in your head, whether you're a mom or not, it doesn't matter this negative voice in your head that always says, I'm not good enough, fast enough, thin enough, tough enough, patient enough, wife enough, daughter enough, father enough, mother enough, all the things. And um, it's this really loud voice. And um, many of the individuals that I work with don't really realize they're even doing this. And so we'll talk about how you can, you know, acknowledge that 
interestingly, because I know this is a, a family organization, in my research, I found that 75% of the time, when it comes to women, 75% of the time, a woman's self-doubt is born during or before adolescence. So when you were a teenager or younger, it's very likely, 75% likely, that that's when your dragon of self-doubt was born and someone made you or some situation made you feel less than and you've been going through life collecting evidence that you suck that you're not good enough and um and so a big part of the book the first part of the book is about identifying your dragon and where it came from how it was born and we don't stay there too long in the book because the past is the past but i think it's important to acknowledge what perhaps gave birth to your dragon of self-doubt um, when it comes to the last terrible thing that you said to yourself um, if you're so inspired and you want to throw it in the chat if you're courageous enough to throw it in the chat i invite you to do that it's really about owning it and not being embarrassed by it and as you could see from the video there are um, plenty of individuals that say pretty dark terrible things about themselves and again i'm a researcher so i see this stuff all the time and the real power is when you're able to identify it and then admit it so um, I'm going to go through a couple um, premises that are talked about in Slay Like a Mother. And the first one is really foundational. And it is the difference between struggling and suffering. And so struggling or your struggles in your life are brought on by the external circumstances in your life. So feeding your family, you know, seven days a week, going through a breast cancer diagnosis, getting divorced, having a child with ADHD, you name it, right? There's plenty of struggles. The number one struggle um, for parents in the United States is dinner time because it happens every day. <laughs> and just when you feel like you nail it on Tuesday, you have to figure it out on Wednesday and then again on Thursday. And it's such an exhausting cycle that is often glamorized, right? In advertising, don't you feel like all the ads are like happy families sitting around the table and holding hands? <laughs> and um, it's really quite a chore for a lot of people. So you get the point, those are struggles. They're external circumstances in your life. But suffering happens when we yell at ourselves for having those struggles in the first place, or we're beating ourselves up for not handling them better. So for example, a struggle can be dinner time and everyone has that struggle. That's not unique to you, but you dip down into suffering when you say things like, come on, Destiny, when are you gonna get your act together? And why can't you figure out dinner time? And all of your friends feed their children vegetables three meals a day and yours are eating Jolly Ranchers. <laughs> And it's just, again, this negative self-talk. And there's a great chart um, in the book that I was just going to show you real quickly that um, illustrates this difference. Sorry, I have it flagged here. Um, and it's, it's the goal. So this is what, this is how I talk about in the book. So the struggling is above the line, the external circumstances in your life. And then we dip down into suffering. And I think what's fascinating and what I've learned from my research is that we suffer at our own hands. In other words, no one can make you, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can make you feel bad about yourself without your permission. And so the struggles in your life are never going to go away. Even if two of them that you have go away this week, you're never getting out of dinner time. And you are always going to face future struggles, right? So I have two teenagers right now. I've never had teenagers before. I don't know what I'm doing. It's very, very hard. And having younger kids really has nothing in common with having teenagers. So 
you're always going to have the struggles, but you don't have to suffer. So the way that I usually talk about it is that the struggle is real, but your suffering is optional. And what I want you to know and take away is that the goal is to struggle. That's the human existence. Do you know anyone in your life that doesn't struggle with something? Like, of course not. Everyone struggles. But a lot of times, especially women, we beat ourselves up because we think that we're pathetic and everybody else is perfect and that we shouldn't have struggles and that we're losers because we have struggles. So I say that if you're struggling, you're winning <laughs> and you're doing a good job and welcome to the human existence because it's just the way that it goes. And so um, now I'm going to talk about um, the crux of the book is seven ways that you're feeding this dragon of self-doubt and how you can stop. And I'm going to pick three of them and, and, and talk about those three. But first, I want to read to you from the invitation. It's the very, very beginning of the book to give you a sense of what I mean by this dragon of self-doubt. There's a dragon raging inside of you and it has a name, it's self-doubt. You're the only one who can see it, so you are the only one who can slay it. You have two choices. You either learn to slay this beast or it will slowly and silently slay you. If you don't rise up and take back your life and sanity, the constant battle and fighting will wear you down and wear you out and you, your family, and the world will miss out on the best of you. You already have the tools, resources, and weapons you need within you to slay this dragon, but you just don't know it because you've been denying the dragon's existence for entirely too long. I slayed my dragon and my life dramatically improved. Now I've dedicated my life to helping others do the same. You can do this. I will help you. Let's go slay some dragons. So again, I love the metaphor of this dragon because for 20 years of my life, from age 15 to 35, I lived with a dragon of self-doubt that chewed up everything I did wrong, nothing I did right, and constantly told me that I was not good enough. No matter what I achieved on the outside, I had many trappings of success that blindly impressed a lot of people. But on the inside, I was hollow and I was empty and I was always running and always chasing. And I'm not a magician. I'm just a girl from Richmond, Virginia. And I figured out how to slay this dragon through years and years of therapy dozens and dozens of self-help books, hundreds of episodes of the Oprah Winfrey show, <laughs> and um, quite a bit of red wine along the way. And so um, my point in saying that is that if I can do this, then anyone can do this. I didn't wave a magic wand and suddenly it happened. And so I hope that is some encouragement for you. So Again, I'm going to go through three ways that you might be feeding this dragon of self-doubt and how you can stop. And um, just to reiterate what Stacey said, if you have any questions, um, we don't have to wait till the end. If you want to throw something in the chat, if you want to message Stacey privately, or if you want to raise your hand, um, we can do it that way. But feel free to jump in and ask any questions that you might have. So. The first way that you might be feeding this dragon of self-doubt is through the negative self-talk that you saw in the video. And so I wanna give you an example um, about what to do. Everybody always asks me like, how do I make it go away? Well, the answer is you're never going to make it go away. Um, we do have an unusually high number of negative thoughts every single day, but sometimes that's designed to help us, right? To be more cautious, to be 
um, to pay like a heightened attention to something. And so you're never going to get the negative self-talk to completely go away, but you can teach it some manners. And I want to give you an example from my own life that reveals a little too much information about me, but it will definitely make the point. So um, I am a fan of the Peloton bike. And um, a while back, I found myself at um, a hotel on a business trip and they had a Peloton bike in um, the hotel gym. And I got up before my meetings that morning and I rode the bike. And at the end of the ride, I was resting my hands kind of, you know, on the top side of my backside, if you will, kind of stretching. And again, my dragon at this point is dead, but it's interesting how its echo will still come back or it'll try to come back to life and, you know, haunt me. So. I, when I reach and I'm stretching back, I grab what feels like two handfuls of cellulite. And so the negative voice in my head immediately goes, oh my gosh, what must that look like? You know, and I, I'm looking around the gym, like, can everybody see my cellulite? <laughs> and I start to get really paranoid and a little clammy. And um, so my point is that first and foremost, I heard the negative voice. I didn't allow it to just run all over me and be like, what must that look like? So I heard what it said. And if that's the only thing that you take away tonight, if you can start be, being conscious of what you actually say to yourself, it's extraordinary. That's going to change your life. So I heard myself say, what must that look like? And then I taught that negative voice from some manners. And I immediately said in my mind, what this looks like is that I got my rear end out of bed and put it on a bike. That's what this looks like. And so that's an example of having the strength and the power and the wisdom to say to my dragon of self-doubt, you're not going to have the last word. You don't get to decide how I feel about me. And this dragon might have been like, oh, it's so embarrassing. You have cellulite. But I got to correct it. I got to teach it some manners. And so one way that you can think about when you're trying to teach it some manners is direct it towards a friend. So if your best friend said, oh gosh, I went to go exercise and I got on the bike and I had all this cellulite, what would you say? Would you say that's because you're fat? No, you would say, what are you talking about? You got out of bed and you exercise. That's, that's fantastic. And so we need to learn to speak to ourselves the way that we speak to people that we actually love and respect. And so that can just be the redirect. So again, first you have to hear the voice. And then secondly, you have to direct it towards um, someone you love and in a, a kind um, way. And when I first started doing this, when I still had a full-fledged fire-breathing dragon inside of me, I would have a piece of paper handy and I would just write down these terrible things that I was saying to myself, like, you're always late. What's wrong with you? Why can't you get your act together? Or all the other mothers are volunteering at your son's school and, you know, you're not doing that. And, um, and so, again, seeing things in your own handwriting can really open this up. And for me, when I started to see it in my own handwriting, it made it undeniable. I couldn't lie about it anymore. I couldn't say, oh, that's not true. I don't think that about myself. I was like, whoa, I think some pretty dark stuff about myself. And that'll inspire my experience and my research shows that that can inspire some change um, on your end. So the, the first way that you might be feeding your dragon is that negative self-doubt, negative self-talk. Um, and then, you know, with your partner, with your spouse, 
you know, have this conversation, ask your spouse, what's the last terrible thing that you said to yourself? And I really do see a marked difference between men and women in this arena. And I am generalizing and I will, that's my disclaimer. Um, but what I see a lot um, came to life several years ago when I was giving a speech in person and I asked the crowd to just like this, think about the last terrible thing that they said to themselves. It happened to be a crowd of both men and women. And um, and then, so you guys are a little bit lucky that we're not in, per in person because when we're a person, I usually make the audience turn to the person next to them and say it out loud, which is you know horrifying and embarrassing, but also very enlightening for people. And so it just so happened that there was a husband and wife couple that were on the front row this day. So when they, when I said, you know, turn to the person next to you and share the last terrible thing that you said to yourself, the, the wife in this case was horrified. And she, she had like 12 things that she, she had written down, horrible things she had said to herself. And so she was so scared to say to her husband how she really feels about herself that she stalled by saying, you go first. And so he looked at her and said, I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't think of anything. I know what she's asking about, but I really can't think of the last terrible thing that I said to myself. I'm, I'm trying. And this woman was so horrified, just couldn't believe that her husband had nothing bad to say about himself that she went to Instagram and posted in all caps. And she said, ladies, this is why men rule the world. <laughs> she said, can you imagine what you could accomplish who you could be, what you could do if you could not recall the last terrible thing that you said to yourself. Now, I have met women that cannot recall the last terrible thing that they said to themselves. They are few and far between, but they do exist. But so then after this experience, I started studying the difference between men and women in general. Um, between negative self-talk. And what I have found is that for men, the negative voice in their head is often critical. So do better next time, get back to the gym, you know, it's critical. But for women, it's cruel. And that's the difference. That it's not a terrible thing to have a critical voice in your head that's kind of inching you along to be better and, and do better, but there is no point and no upside to having a voice in your head that is cruel. And I think that we would all agree that the women in the video that you saw, um, that that was cruelty. And, you know, we hear a lot about the mommy wars and, you know, working versus stay at home, breastfeeding versus bottle feeding, all of these um, mommy wars that the media loves to write about. But according to my research, mothers are not at war with other mothers, we're at war with ourselves. And that's where the real war is. That's where the battleground is. That's where the true healing has to happen. And so that's why I say, can you share this with a partner? Can you share this with a friend? And there's a lot that as women, we can learn from men. My husband doesn't speak to himself this way. And so it's another example that it's possible to not walk around and um, degrade ourselves all day, every day. So I just think that's a fascinating topic. Um, and if you are a man, I think it's great to ask the women in your life, ask them what the last terrible thing that they said to themselves was, and, and um, it'll be a very eye-opening experience because for the most part, we keep this inside. And um, I believe that dragons of self-doubt thrive in silence and darkness and avoidance. And so it's great to have a partner that can pull this out of us when possible. 
So that was the first way, the negative voice in your head. And the, the second- Catherine, oh, sorry, excuse me. I just wanted to chime in if that's okay. I wanted, I have a comment here and maybe you can help um, answer the question or give some uh, direction. So when you talk about um, talking to yourself like you talk to your friend, you know, when you have these things you're saying to yourself, um, what if you don't think the same things about yourself that you think about your friend? So what advice would you give to that person? How could you help them? Okay, I think that, all right, so first of all, I would write it down, um, you know, so I, I'm just using examples from women that have been in other workshops of mine. I mean, people will say, you're fat, you're ugly, and it's a miracle your partner loves you. I mean, terrible, terrible things. And, um, and so then I think that the goal is um, you don't have to meet it back. Like my example on the bike, I didn't meet it back by saying you don't have cellulite or you're beautiful. Like I didn't like flood myself with compliments. I just made it more about reality. Like what this looks like is I decided to exercise. And so it was a little bit like I was saying to my dragon, like get off my back as opposed to oh, shut up. I'm so beautiful, you know, and super thin. Like that's, and so you don't have to think about maybe the reference of speaking, you know, to a friend is too much for you right now, because if you don't love yourself, if you don't like yourself, which is exactly where I was, it may be too much, but can you get to neutral territory of just being like, get off my back, you know, and just let me be in peace. And, you know, you're kind of saying that to your dragon, but also every once in a while, some of the anecdote can be, if you're not there yet, the anecdote can be, um, well, when can I see the good in me? So if I'm willing to see the bad, like I have cellulite, I'm a terrible cook, I yelled at my son last night, right? It's really easy for us to see the bad, but every once in a while, can you just see the good? And um, I just released a blog post today on um, my website about how pride can be the anecdote to your dragon of self-doubt. And so just think about right now, everybody here, one thing that you're proud of about yourself, one thing. You've done something interesting lately. You were, even if it's little, like I remembered the field trip permission slip form and I always forget and I'm proud of myself for that. Or you had a tough conversation with a friend. You had a tough conversation with your child. And so um, if you're not there yet for the compliments, then I would say just start to notice where you can be proud of yourself. Um, and that just has to be part of your mission moving forward. If you're going to see the bad and, um, you know, I'll just take like our physical appearance. There's times inevitably that we all look in the mirror or the reflection in the car, right? That we're like, oh, where did all those sprinkles come from? You know, or I've got to get my hair done or like whatever trash talk, you know, but if you have a positive moment in the mirror, if you have a positive moment with your teenager or your child, can you start to see those? And um, eventually that'll start to balance itself out and at a minimum you'll feel neutral about yourself. But that's a great, great comment and question. So thank you. And please keep them coming. If anything else you want any clarification or um, have any questions about, um, the second area that I'm going to talk about is our expectations for ourselves. And um, I believe that expectations are the root of all evil. In other words, I used to have extraordinary expectations for myself. And I thought it was going to make me better. It would make me a better mom, a better employee, you know, if I had really, really high expectations for myself, but my therapist taught me about how that was setting me up for failure. So I'm going to read a little part of the book. This was an exercise from my therapist. And she had me write down, like she said, like, Catherine, what are your expectations for yourself? I just want to see them in writing. And I want you to see them in writing. So she asked me to write down my expectations for motherhood, and then my expectations for myself. And again, this is about eight years ago. This is what I said. Uh, my expectations for motherhood. 
I think it should be joyful, rewarding, fulfilling, and easy. I've never heard anyone, my mother, grandmother, or other mothers say it's hard. So I think it's probably supposed to be pretty easy. My expectations for myself, be a good mother every hour of every day in everyone's eyes. And so hopefully it just makes me teary to even remember that that's what I expected of myself, that I basically have to be perfect every hour of every day in everyone's eyes. And um, this is another exercise in writing it down where you're like, ooh, that's what I expect of myself. That's so horrifying. That's, and so we think that these expectations of perfection or always performing are going to help us push us ahead, but they really drain our soul. When we put our heads on the pillow every night, we're like, well, I failed again. I failed again. I didn't make it through the day doing those things. And so um, after lots of therapy, I rewrote my expectations. And this is what I said years later. My expectations for motherhood. I expect that it's gonna be a shit show. I expect that I'm going to always, I'm always going to need help and I'm always going to ask for it. And then my expectations for myself. I expect to do the best that I can. I expect that I'm gonna lose my patience and temper from time to time. I expect that every day is gonna bring a challenge that I won't know how to deal with. I expect that I am not, will not be perfect and I'm okay with that. And so this was revolutionary for me to go from expecting, as we all do, we fall into this trap. I'm gonna have this perfect meal made. I'm gonna have everything all figured out. I'm never gonna yell at my children. And um, we just fall short of that and we feel like failures. And so I'm a big believer in just setting more realistic expectations for yourself, which you saw in my own example. And so to put this in your own life, and if you want to throw this in the chat, um, what's one or two things that are new to you in your life right now? Maybe two things that are new to you in this season of your life. So Maybe you just got a new job recently. Maybe you just became a step parent. Maybe you're dealing with a health diagnosis in your family. Maybe you're getting married. Um, two things that are new to you. And again, write them down in your own handwriting. And so these are the areas of your life where you need to level set your expectations. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that's new to be in my life is teenagers. Brand new, have no idea what I'm doing. I have a almost 13 and 15 year old. And having a three-year-old and a five-year-old, it gives you no experience for having a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old. But when I wrote that down and said, okay, what's new to me is being the mother of teenagers, this is where I need to give myself grace. And this is where I need to expect that I'm going to make mistakes. So anything that you wrote down, um, if it's new to you in this season of your life, it means that you're a rookie. And rookies don't get things right the first time. Rookies make mistakes. And rookies have to figure things out. And I think as parents, we often think, oh, well, I've been a mother for 15 years. And so I've been a parent for 15 years. I should have this all figured out, right? Wrong. Because yes, I've been a mother for almost 15 years, but I have been a parent to a 15-year-old for a matter of weeks. Like, I don't have experience doing this. And so why in the world would I expect to do it perfectly? Why in the world would you expect that you're going to be great at a new job? Are you going to be great at starting a nonprofit? Are you going to be great at dealing with a breast cancer diagnosis? And I think that's the real shame is that, especially as parents, because we want to do this job quite well, um, we believe that we should be more experienced. We believe that we should do better and perform better, even when we have no experience. And so a tip I'll give you here 
is um, when I'm going through new things in my life, I take out a post-it note and I write the phrase, I expect this to be hard. I expect this to be hard. And I take that post-it note and I put it I put it on my computer. You can put it wherever you want. You can put it on your mirror in the bathroom. You can put it on the dashboard on your car. You can put it on your computer, right where you grab your keys every day, somewhere that you're going to see it on a regular basis. And the beauty, when you see the words, again, in your own handwriting that say, I expect this to be hard, then when the situation that you're dealing with is hard, because you're new at it, you're able to look at that post-it note and go, oh, that's right. I told myself that this was going to be hard. That's, it's hard because it's hard, not because I'm a loser, not because I'm a failure, not because I'm doing a bad job. And so you're always going to have these two or three things in your life for the rest of your life that are new to you and acknowledging the newness will help you level set your expectations. And so you can do the exercise from the book of the big macro expectations of what are you really expecting from yourself, but then also keep that post-it note handy so that you can remind yourself that something is new. And then the last area of ways that you're feeding this dragon of self-doubt is your inability to say no, right? So we're terrible at this. We're like, yes, you got it. Yep, I'm your girl. I got it. Yep, I'm on it. Yes. And um, we have a thousand ways to say yes, and we have no idea to how to say no. And what I want you to know is that if there's not enough time on your calendar for you, then in, in other words, if you're giving all of your time away, to your children, to your partner, to your job, to whatever. It means essentially that you believe other people deserve your time more than you do. So I'm just gonna say that again. If you don't have enough time for yourself and you're giving it all away, it means that you believe that other people deserve your time more than you do. And that has got to end. You have got to come to the point that you beat down this dragon of self-doubt and this book will help you. Um, but you have to get to the point where you believe that you are worthy of your own time. That it doesn't have to be the leftovers and the crumbs that are left for you. And so two tips here. One is to go to your calendar if you need more me time and your calendar tomorrow for Wednesday is probably a joke, right? It's so full, it's so jam packed. So there's no time for you to exercise, to take a walk, to have a glass of wine with your friends, whatever. Um, but if you fast forward on your calendar, go out like three weeks from tomorrow and there's a lot more real estate, right? There's a lot more open time on your calendar three weeks from now and start to plot out time that is just for you and is important to you. And so it could be, and the key is to do it in reoccurring meetings. So every Wednesday morning, you're gonna to go to this exercise class that you've been dying to go to. Every other Thursday evening, you're gonna chat with your girlfriend, you know, on the phone for an hour. It doesn't have to be healthy. Um, or you're gonna, you know, take a bath or you're gonna, um, you know, go to a museum once a month, whatever it is. But the point is that it's reoccurring. And the reason that it's reoccurring, the power of that, is it means that you really only have to get up the courage one time <laughs> to believe that you're worthy of your time, to believe that you can say every Wednesday morning, I'm gonna do this and every Sunday afternoon, I'm going to do this. And so, because what happens is we wait for our calendars to fill up with everyone else's priorities except for our own. And then we use the excuse that there's no time for me. I don't have time to work out. I don't have time to meditate. I don't have time to do whatever, read self-help books because everybody else needs me. 
And what you'll see, and this is, has definitely been true in my life, is you'll put yourself on your calendar. All the other crap is still going to fit. <laughs> you're still going to take the kids to the dentist. You're still going to take them to school. You're still going to volunteer. You're still going to get involved um, with different activities. But you're going to be on your calendar first. And another key thing here is that to this day, I do this, and I even color code all of these activities, very type A, you can't tell, um, that I color coded all in dark purple on my calendar. And the reason that I do that is that if I show up to any given week, this week, you know, second week in December, and it's all pre-planned, I'm already on my calendar for, you know, years from now. But if I show up to any given week and there's not enough purple because I've deleted it, um, you know, for other things, then it means I'm falling back into my old ways. And it means that I'm giving away too much of my time and not saving it for myself. And so that dark purple is an indicator to me that I'm taking time for myself. And that is important. And then the last thing on not being able to say no, I like to say no in bulk. In other words, what's one thing that tomorrow you can say no to in bulk? Meaning, instead of just saying, I'm not going to go to church this Sunday because I'm going to like take a break. It's like, can you say, I'm getting off of this church committee moving forward? Or I'm no longer going to volunteer in this way. Or I'm no longer going to drive the carpool both ways and I'm going to find somebody to share the load with me. So think of something in your life that you're doing right now that you really don't want to be doing. It feels like a time suck. It feels like a drain. And um, can you say no to it in bulk? And what I found when I, we're so scared of saying no, right? We think everybody's going to hate that, hate us. The world is going to fall apart. What I found is that people don't care about you as much as you think they care about you at all. And so once you start saying no and start saying, you know, I'm not going to be able to volunteer for this or do this, um, nine times out of 10, the person on the receiving end is like, okay, <laughs> I understand. And so we fear this great backlash, but it's very, very rarely the case. Um, so I'm going to open it up to questions in just a minute, but um, one more tip, because this is such a, a family-focused group, people often ask me, how do I help my children slay their dragon of self-doubt, you know? And um, first of all, I think you have to be on the path yourself, just like if you can't dribble a basketball, it's hard to teach your child to do that, right? So some things that in this case, you have to start on that path yourselves. But one activity that can be really, really helpful with your children is to share at the end of the day, um, share your peak and your pit from the day. So I did this for years with my children, especially when they were younger. And, um, and I did it individually. So as I was putting them to bed, I would say, um, you know, what was your peak in your pit from the day? The, the best part of your day and the worst part of your day. And I shared mine as well. And what this taught my children was that every day has a part of it that sucks. Every day has a low point. Because I think, unfortunately, our culture raises us to believe everything's got to be bigger. It's got to be better. It's got to be flourishing. Everything's going to be great. There's no bad days. There's no bad moments. And if your child starts to learn that every day has a part of it that's kind of terrible, and they can give voice to that, and they can use their voice to say that this was a really bad part of my day, it's really, really powerful. Because as I mentioned earlier, dragons of self-doubt thrive in silence and darkness and avoidance. And I grew up in a household where talking about bad things, talking about negative things really wasn't accepted. And everything had to be happy, happy, joy, joy. Everybody had a great day. And that's why I love the, the peak in the pit because um, it helps your children see that life has highs and lows. And 
you will learn more about yourself when you do this. It's like, wow, for the past month, my pit has always been around X, Y, Z, a certain relationship, a certain aspect of your life. And when you start to say it out loud, it's the same thing as writing it down. You can start to change those behaviors over time. So I share that as an activity that can be really, really powerful. It also shows your children that their parents are not perfect and that their parents have bad moments and sad moments. And I think that can be really powerful. So um, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Catherine. And I think what you were just saying, learning how to say no and understanding that our days are not perfect play into a question we have here. How do we as parents handle the high expectations from our children and then the negative that comes from them when we disappoint them? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. And if you're courageous enough, I would go through this exercise that's in the book of writing down your expectations and do it with your child. Like we have to give voice to this. So do you have the courage to sit down with your child and say, what are your expectations of me? And, um, and so that you can hear it and also that they can give voice to it because my experience is that sometimes we think that our children's expectations for us are higher than they actually are. And I think it depends on the age of the child, but um, you might be surprised that they're not as high as you think they are. I did this exercise with my daughter. Now she was young at the time, but um, she was like seven. And I asked her what her expectations were of me. And she said to, um, to be nice to me and buy me pink clothes. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, I feel like I could probably do that. You know, but even knowing, even though being nice is sometimes a high expectation because we have short patients, um, knowing that was her expectation was empowering to me and it made me nicer, you know, to her. Um, so I would say here for yourself what they really are. And if they are completely out of whack, then I think you have to give voice to that to say, I'm not perfect and I can't do all of those things for you. And I'm flawed as a human being and we all are, and I'm just doing my best, but getting it out of the darkness. That's great, thank you. And I think also letting our children know that we are not perfect allows them to understand that they are not perfect and it's okay not to be perfect. Exactly, exactly. And that's so empowering. It seems so minor, but um, that's the beauty of sharing your own pits, you know, and um, uh, that they can see that you're flawed. It's a gift. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to share um, in the beginning when you showed the video, we did have a few comments because I think it's really important to share that numerous people said the video was relatable and it's making me cry because I had no idea other people felt the same as me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really telling um, today and to make everyone know and understand to talk to your friends or talk to other people because they are inevitably most likely feeling like you are. And that is very helpful to understand and know someone feels the same as you. Yeah, I hope that video serves as a catalyst. Um, I'm so grateful for whoever said that because I think it's um, it really opened my eyes and it gave me a lot of courage to, to talk about the tough stuff knowing that everybody else feels the same way.